what I want to do uh, in this uh, conversation tonight is to clarify that when we talk about healthy eating, active living, health is the goal and sort of all its ramifications. BMI has a place, but it also has limitations. And, and quite often up in the last, say, 20 or 30 years, BMI has held a disproportionate amount of sway in the way we look at, at, at health. I want to review the key behavioral contributors to health, healthy eating and active living, but whatever is good for kids and youth is also good for adults, so it goes across the age spectrum. Tonight I'm going to focus primarily on nutrition. I'll sort of glance over physical activity, sedentary and, act and sleep, not because they're not important, but my focus will be on nutrition. And at the end of the day, I want to provide an evidence-based template for healthy eating and active living regardless of your BMI. So the WHO organization defines health as a state of complete physical, mental, and social well-being, and they all are intertwined, not merely the absence of disease or infirmity. Our current societal focus on uh, avoiding being overweight may actually compromise physical well-being. We have about 1% of adolescent girls suffering from anorexia nervosa. Mental well-being, we see depression and guilt for people that are overweight or obese. And we also see social well-being being, being uh, compromised because excess weight is falsely attributed to either sloth or gluttony. So there's a lot of prejudice against people that have excess weight. Monitoring the BMI, the body mass index, has a definite role, but we need to know both its strengths and limitations. So what is the BMI and how does it relate to health? Well, BMI, body mass index, is the ratio of weight in kilograms uh, divided by the height in meters squared. It is a proxy measure of fat, and it assumes a sort of average level of muscularity. So Arnold Schwarzenegger bodybuilders might have a high BMI, but in their case, it's not a, a really good proxy measure of fat. But for most of society, we don't have an epidemic of muscularity. We actually have excessive fat deposition. So it's pretty good for at a pop population level. We say with a BMI that's between 25 and 30, we classify that as overweight, and above 30 is obese. And it relates to mortality at a population level, but not necessarily to the individual. And I'll talk more about that in a moment. So this graph just exemplifies, again, the loose relationship, or our relationship, again, between body fat and body mass index. We see as the percentage, or as the body mass index goes up along that uh, x-axis, it correlates with increasing fat deposition. Women at any given BMI will have more fat than, than men. So this is somewhat of a busy slide, but I'm going to go through it a little bit because in the last 10 years or so, people can get confused because there'll be studies published which say, well, no, BMI doesn't relate to, over, uh, doesn't relate to excess mortality, uh, or in fact, being a little bit overweight is healthier. So what I'll draw your attention to is the bottom right-hand corner, which on the x-axis is BMI at 50 years of age versus relative risk of death. And you can see the healthiest place to be, where you get the bottom of the J curve there, is at a BMI of around 23 to 25. Above 25, the risk of death uh, goes up in a linear fashion. We arbitrarily define overweight as 25 to 30, and above 30 as being obese. But there's no clear demarcation. There's not a step effect here. It's a, it's a linear effect. If you look over to the left of that graph, then you'll see that the, uh, the, the little line drops below the one mark and appears to be a reduced risk of death if your BMI is sort of between 25 and 30. That's because smokers are included in that group. And you have to take smokers out of any sort of BMI um, lack of health calculation because having a little bit of excess tissue, being slightly overweight when you're a smoker, is probably a marker for the fact that you don't smoke very much. So you're getting some confounding there. So it appears to be healthy uh, when you're, or healthier when your BMI is, say, 26, 27. That's because it probably means you're a non-smoker. Similarly, if you go to the top right-hand corner, that's looking at age references. If you are a little bit overweight and you're 70 or 75 years of age, it means that you're probably very healthy. You haven't begun to get the dwindles, the chronic diseases which cause weight loss. So you have to take out the elderly, you have to take out the smokers, and that's that bottom right-hand corner, which quite clearly and in all good studies shows a linkage between BMIs above 25 and increased risk of mortality. So 
We know that elevated BMI is a risk factor because of its association with cardiovascular disease, type 2 diabetes. Now there's 13 different cancers associated with elevated BMIs, hypertension, and stroke. And if you look longitudinally and you look at somebody who's 40 years in age, an adult at 40 years of age, and you follow them over the next 30 years, people that are overweight at age 40 on average lose three years of life, and those that are obese at age 40 on average lose six years of life. So BMI does matter. It is important, but it doesn't necessarily important for every single individual. So what does fat do and what about it? Well, it's not just currently unfashionable. Fat is an active hormonal organ. It's not just padding but the type and location of fat is important. So the sort of fat which is most obvious, this kind of love handle stuff, uh, cellulite, that sort of thing, that's subcutaneous, that's not very metabolically active fat. It doesn't cause a lot of harm. The fat that is most harmful is the visceral, the deep fat, that's the stuff that uh, winds around our intestines and is around our kidneys. That's uh, the, what we call the visceral or abdominal fat. <clears throat> This is just, I won't go through all this, but it just, it's a, it's a diagram of a fat cell and a dipocyte and just shows you all the things it secretes. So it's, they are busy little creatures. They're releasing uh, uh, types of hormones, tumor necrosis factor, interleukins, which cause inflammation and cause negative effects. It's releasing fatty acids that can go into your heart and uh, clog up your coronary arteries. It, cause, it also releases resistin, which causes insulin resistance and leads to type 2 diabetes and a whole bunch of other stuff. So it's not just an innocent uh, bit of uh, padding. So how do we define childhood overweight and obesity? Well, it's based on the health impacts that we observe in adults. There's really not a lot of good data relating any given BMI in a child to any sort of health status, but we know that 25 and 30, those are adverse markers. So we work backwards from adult morbidity thresholds to figure out trajectories which are of ill health. So this is a uh, graph of BMI <clears throat> for boys at different ages based on the World Health Organization criteria. The criteria, to make things more confusing, the criteria to um, delegate somebody overweight and obese has changed quite a bit over the last 30 years. Initially, we used the Center for Disease Control in Atlanta, their criteria. Then we used the International BC Task Force criteria, and now we're using WHO criteria. They're pretty similar, but they can, they can uh, be a little confusing if you're trying to compare apples to oranges. In any event, if you look at that overweight uh, curve there, that 85th centile, that is a trajectory that if a child stays on from the time they're 8, 9, 10 years old, they continue on that curve. By the time they're 18 or 19, their BMI will be 25. It'll be in that overweight range. So when we see a child in the office and I plot their height and their weight, calculate their BMI and their age 11, and I say, okay, you are overweight. It's based upon the relationship to that growth trajectory, and if they go that way into adulthood, similar for obesity, it's a growth trajectory that will intersect with the BMI of 30 or above. So what's actually happened when we look at the population of children and youth in Canada over the last 30 years or so? We see back in 1978, which is <clears throat> the time frame that we think the obesity epidemic just got started. The uh, blue bar there, 23% in 1978, is combined overweight obesity rates of around 23%. 25 years later, uh, the combined rate had jumped up to 34%. The rate of obesity had doubled from 6% to 12.7%. In the last 10 years or so, we've seen a modest improvement. However, the levels are still dangerously high for unhealthy weights. So we've seen a drop of around 10% from 34 to 31% in overweight and obesity combined, but we still have 12% of, uh, of youth that are obese, and that is, that is dangerously high. So what are the actual effects of childhood obesity? Well, you have some joint problems because you have wear and tear in the joints. You can get increased incidence of asthma because those odipocytes are secreting inflammatory uh, proteins that affect the breathing. Sleep apnea, uh, so they don't think as well during the day because they've not been sleeping well. Mental health effects are there. It's a little bit unclear, chicken and egg, whether if you're anxious and depressed, you have a weight problem, or because you have a weight problem, you're anxious and depressed. Probably uh, there are some in both camps uh, in terms of that effect. But we also know the data is pretty consistent that youth who are obese rate the quality of their life lower than do children who have cancer. So because of the societal 
I would say, prejudice against overweight and obesity, quite often these children are not very happy. What's probably less appreciated is the growing incidence of hypertension in children who are obese, dyslipidemia, so elevated triglycerides, LDL, glucose intolerance, and even now, frank type 2 diabetes, which we never saw when I was uh, back in medical school way back when uh, in youth. Now we are beginning to see in youth in, in, in elevated numbers. So the, that constellation of those um, hypertension, dyslipidemia, glucose intolerance, and abdominal mo uh, obesity, that cluster is called the metabolic syndrome, and that's very tightly linked with adverse health effects in adulthood. Now, the amazing thing is that cluster also shows problems in children, either as individual risk factors or once they're together. So hypertension in childhood, well, we know that hypertension in adults raises the risk of vascular dementia and cognitive dysfunction. The brain really does need to get uh, perfused at a fairly stable uh, level. If you have high blood pressure or low pressure, it doesn't work as well. But now we know that in childhood, hypertension also affects children's cognition. And this is important because unhealthy weights contribute to hypertension proportionally to the degree of adiposity. So the more plump the child is, the more likely they are to have hypertension. There's evidence between a link with hypertension and decreased cognitive function in youth. So kids who have elevated blood pressure aren't thinking as well on objective cognitive measures. And treating the hypertension in children improves executive function. So in a world where we have a knowledge-based economy and there's more and more pressure on doing well in school, this is alarming that uh, with our epidemic of obesity, we might be decreasing cognitive function. So these elements of metabolic syndrome can happen very early in children. This particular study here is from Italy. It's looking at kids between the age of two and, uh, and six years of age. You saw 6% with glucose problems, 13% were hypertensive, 25% had abnormal lipids. Some were seeing non-alcoholic fatty liver disease, almost a third. So that's fat infiltration of the liver, which leads to cirrhosis later on in life, liver cancer and premature death. This is very, very serious stuff that's happening in preschoolers. 40% uh, of their sample had at least one metabolic abnormality. Canadian children aren't really faring that much better. This is from data from the Canadian Health Measures Survey 2007 to 2009, age 6 to 17, and you saw basically a doubling in the rates of adverse metabolic syndrome precursors. So doubling in the rate of blood pressure between those who are of normal weight, healthy weight, and uh, abnormal weight or uh, overweight or obesity. You saw about a 50% increase in dyslipidemia, that's LDL and triglycerides, and uh, roughly a threefold increase in the risk of glucose intolerance, which is a sort of precursor to type 2 diabetes, which has long-term health effects. I'll go over this very quickly, but this is a very disturbing study to me. Looked at metabolic syndrome in youth, so that cluster of those bad uh, uh, factors. They looked at 49 kids with and 62 without metabolic syndrome, did cognitive testing, did sophisticated MRIs of their brains, and they saw lower cognitive performance in youth with uh, metabolic syndrome and structural changes in their brain related to blood pressure changes, lipid brain changes as well. So no surprise, there's a, there's a thinking brain link. We were, it's a thinking machine. And when you have metabolic syndrome, it puts you at high risk. In Canada, there are roughly a quarter of a million teens who are obese. <clears throat> when we looked at BC at a subpopulation who went to shape down of obese youth, 25% had metabolic syndrome. So the worst case scenario in Canada is you got 60,000 obese teens at risk for serious cognitive dysfunction because of their overweight obesity. So it's, it's a big problem. And we know that metabolic syndrome in adults, because kids don't tend to outgrow this, is just going to get worse due to the cerebrovascular reactivity, the blood flow, neuroinflammation, oxidative stress, and lipids that adults have impaired executive function, memory, and attention. So hypertension, oh, sorry, unhealthy weights in children and youth matter. Uh, you get hypertension-triggered cognitive effects on, uh, evident by middle, middle, middle school. You get uh, the toxic effects of metabolic syndrome apparent by adolescence. And the duration of exposure to obesity increases the risk of heart disease. So what this means is, say 30 years ago, uh, people became obese at age 30 or 40. After 20 years of obesity, then they began to have their heart attacks. Well, it was due to that 20 or 30 years of obesity. 
If we are triggering obesity at age 15, we're going to see the heart disease at age 40, at younger ages because of the duration of exposure. And also obesity persists and worsens into adulthood. For the most part, uh, certainly adolescents don't outgrow their obesity. So this particular series of bar graphs here uses the International Obesity Task Force definition for obesity, slightly different WHO, but I'll draw your uh, attention to the 12 to 17 bar. So around, and this is in, in 2004, 29% of youth were overweight and obese. Stats Canada followed uh, a, a cohort of that group for eight years. Within eight years, 50%, sorry, 30% of those that were of normal weight became overweight. 30% of those that were overweight became obese. So this is basically a one-way road of worsening. If this type of behavior continues by, uh, say, 2040, 70% of the adult population will be overweight or obese. That is a, going to have a huge impact on uh, Canadian healthcare and, and the lives of Canadians. But BMI, of course, is a risk factor for ill health and not an illness in and of itself. There are a significant number of overweight and obese adults who are healthy. They have normal blood pressures, normal, lip, normal lipids, glucose. Their mental health is robust, and they have a normal lifespan. And similar for children and youth. So it, again, it's not, uh, not a death sentence to be overweight or obese, or even a sentence to, uh, to ill health. This kind of a busy graph comes from Arya Sharma from the Edmonton Obesity um, Staging System. And what he did is look at adults who were overweight, obese by class of obesity and overweight from NHANES data, looked at those who, that were the healthy cohort, that's that stage zero and stage one, followed them over the next 10 years and saw that that group that were healthy uh, almost had no significant illness or mobility. So there, there is that uh, uh, sort of what I'd say fat and fit uh, group. This is looking at the, the most overweight group, that class three obesity, that type zero and one that, that showed no metabolic abnormalities, their lifespans were totally normal. And this particular um, slide then shows the significant portion of each of those groups that in fact appear to be totally metabolically healthy and in li all likelihood will have normal lifespan. So as expected amongst that group that were overweight that have just slightly abnormal BMIs, over 40% will likely have normal uh, health outcomes. Uh, if you go, to the class three group, which is the bottom right-hand corner there, who are like morbidly obese, 20% of those individuals will also have uh, healthy outcomes and, and healthy lifespan. Uh, so we think that we can attribute that sort of healthy cohort to a combination of genetics and lifestyle. Of course, we can't do anything around genetics, but it just reinforces the need to focus on lifestyle because it is very hard to uh, lose weight and keep it off. I'll show you that in a minute. So the focus really has to be on getting the habits right. In terms of extremely difficult to lose weight, uh, the science is quite clear now that the body is designed to resist weight loss and to return to its highest set point. Uh, it, it's always, we live in fear, our bodies live in fear of the next famine. Uh, so that when you begin to lose weight, it says, oh, slow down, okay, basal metabolic rate, slow down, don't move so fast, conserve all your calories. There was a study done that looked at the uh, resting metabolic rate from that subgroup of individuals who were on that uh, TV show, The Biggest Loser. So in that cohort, uh, the average weight loss was 58 kilograms. They looked at their resting metabolic rate, what it took to, in terms of calories that they would consume just to run their body uh, before they started losing weight. And their basal metabolic rate then was about 2,600 calories per day. After six years, they came back and looked at this group and they saw, okay, what is their resting or basal metabolic rate now? It had dropped to 1,900. So what that means is the, the amount of food that they used to eat six years ago before they lost weight to maintain their weight, if they ate the same amount now, they would be gaining weight at a tremendous rate because they needed, just to maintain, 700 calories per day less. That's a huge difference, really. So that is why almost all weight reduction diets, when people lose a lot of weight, they get down to the set point. If they don't keep to that very strict um, regimen, a combination of, of diet and physical activity, they will regain weight very quickly, and that's what happened with this group. 
for, on average, they gained 41 kilograms uh, once they stopped the, the program. So they got almost back up to where they were six years later. So the bottom line here is, of course, it's very important not to gain excess weight because it's extremely difficult to lose weight and to keep it off. So what do we know from this? Well, obesity is usually, but not always, unhealthy. But also, there's a significant number of individuals with healthy weights that will develop chronic disease secondary to unhealthy diets and unhealthy activity levels. So chronic disease, which is the end point we're worried about, we're not worried about how you look and, and, and your, your body shape, it can be the result of obesity, uh, it can be the result of an unhealthy lifestyle in and of itself, or the combination. So very often, obesity is a marker for both. You've got the, some dangerous fat levels, but you probably have dangerous habits. If we can't change the fat level very easily, let's work on the habits. Let's work on the habits also to prevent weight gain, to aid in weight loss, and to promote good lifestyle, or good health regardless of, of your weight. So I want to talk a little bit about diet, and this is a busy slide from Mosafarian from Circulation. Again, just to show you how complicated it is. Uh, there's all sorts of stuff. There's a million studies. When you look at your news feeds every day, it's eat more fish, uh, drink more coffee, don't drink alcohol, drink alcohol, how it affects your gut, how it affects your gut microbiome, which was unheard of 20 or 30 years ago. We just didn't pay attention to gut bacteria. Now we think it's critical. Uh, uh, so it's, it's, it's very, very confusing. So what I hope to do today is give you some take-home messages that you can use and implement in your life or in the coffee cooler uh, discussions. So the nutritional factors for unhealthy weight in children and youth are pretty much also the same one for adults. We know a bit more about adulthood, and I'll show you some slides which uh, drill down, are much more granular for, for adults, but for kids, the two biggest things in terms of nutrition are excessive sugary drink intake, and excessive refined grain and added sugar. So I'll give you more information about why those two parameters are really quite uh, detrimental. We'll talk about fast food, uh, high salt, and uh, fruits and vegetables a little bit as well. So what is sugar? As probably many of you know, when we think of sugar and talk about sugar, we're talking about disaccharides, so sugar molecules that are joined together. So the common monosaccharides are galactose and glucose. When they're paired as lactose, that's the sugar in milk or glucose and fructose, when that's paired, it's sucrose. And sucrose is a 50-50 uh, mixture of glucose and fructose. That's the sugar that we spoon all over things. That's those dangerous sugar cubes uh, shown there. High fructose uh, corn syrup is something that we hear a lot about, read a lot about. It is a little confusing, I think, at first blush. We call it high fructose corn syrup <clears throat> because it's, uh, it was made from a high fructose solution. Corn syrup in its natural state is all glucose, and glucose doesn't taste very good. So no one puts glucose on their pancakes uh, or into their pop. Uh, it was discovered how to take high fructose, how, how to take corn syrup, which was all, all um, uh, glucose, and how to enzymatically convert it into something that tastes and, and is just like sucrose. So when it's changed chemically, They've taken this 100% glucose mixture and changed it into a glucose fructose mixture. The high fructose corn syrup that's added to pop is 55% fructose. The high fructose corn syrup that's added to foods tends to be 42%. Anyways, when you eat this stuff and drink it, it breaks apart right away into its glucose and fructose. So it's pretty much the same as sucrose metabolically. Starch is glucose all joined together, so it's glucose polymers. But there's a big difference how you consume glucose, uh, whether it's refined grain or whole grain. Glucose, of course, is what the body runs on. That's what the brain runs on. That's what cells run on. But when you take a whole grain, so that top left-hand corner there is the whole grain, it's composed of a bran, which is the outer shell, which has a lot of fiber. Then it has the germ at the bottom part there. Uh, that is the little prototype uh, seedling, as it were. That's where a lot of good stuff are, the protein, the fatty acids, the phytochemicals. The stuff that tastes really good, though, that's the big part in white bread and, and Cheerios, that sort of thing, is the endosperm. That's mainly just starch. That's just all glucose polymers. So when you take that uh, whole grain and you uh, enzymatically process it, crush it, separate it, that sort of thing, separate the wheat from the chaff, as it were, you get very different properties from refined grain from, from whole grain. So the bottom right-hand graph there shows you the glycemic index, which is how rapidly the glucose goes from when you chew it and swallow it into your bloodstream. So 
natural whole wheat is the little blue graph on the bottom. You eat a whole grain uh, product, like steel cut oats in the morning for breakfast. You get a slow rise in blood sugar, levels off, and slowly drops off. That's what your body's used to working with. The, the pancreas says, oh, sugar. OK, I'll give it a little bit of insulin, and I'll give just enough to match that uh, level of sugar. And I expect it to slowly to stick around for a while, then drop off. If you take away the husk and you take away the bran and you just get all that starch, it acts just like plain table sugar. You swallow it, you get a blast of sugar into your bloodstream, which is that high glycemic red uh, graph up there. Your pancreas says, what the heck's going on? It smashes out a whole bunch of insulin to, to take care of what it thinks is gonna be a sustained level of glucose. The glucose actually disappears from the system because you just got a big rush of it. The insulin then causes rebound low blood sugar. It actually drives hunger. Uh, and that glucose is, that extra glucose that's sloshing around your system is converted into triglycerides and leads to heart disease. So very, very different properties, refined grain versus um, uh, non-refined grain. Other concept that you'll see a lot about is sugars, bound sugars versus free sugars. And this uh, uh, diagram is really to explain sugary drinks and, and uh, uh, how they are created. So the outer circle is, is naturally occurring sugars. So the sugars that are in milk, and those sugars are pretty safe because milk is a combination of fat, of protein, and sugars, but it's absorbed slowly, just sort of that little blue graph that comes on slowly and behaves naturally. Uh, there's also a lot of sugar in intact fruits and vegetables. But because it's in the cell wall, because it's in intact uh, structures, when you consume an apple, you chew it up, it takes a while for the sugar to come on board, it lasts for a while and then drops off, no spike. When we process these foods, so that's the next inner circle, free sugars from processing, you liberate these sugars. They become not no longer bound sugars, but become free sugars. So they're on the left-hand side are products with retained free sugars. So honey, bees take natural products. They do whatever they do with the, the stuff, I don't know. But uh, and they get it and they make it into that sticky stuff that tastes great. That has a lot of sugar. It's really high sugar content. It's retained in the product. Syrup from maple trees, so it's the sap. It's got a certain uh, sugar content in it. We take it, we process it, we boil it down so it has a high sugar concentration. So this is a, a product that doesn't have added sugar, but there's high retained free sugar. It's still quite detrimental. It acts the same sort of way. And then you have fruit juice and fruit concentrate. Uh, that's very much in the news right now, and probably more so as Health Canada comes with their guidelines where they're going to take a serving of fruit and no longer say it's a serving of, um, sorry, a serving of fruit juice is no longer like a serving of fruit. And it's because of this uh, process. So when you take an apple and you squeeze it down and, and take all the um, fiber out of it, you're just left with sugar in solution. So that's what fruit juice is. It is basically just a sugary drink. And then of course you have products on the other side, which are products with added sugars. So the red circle is sugar sweetened beverages, pop, iced teas, that sort of thing. We have water, you're just pouring in high fructose corn syrup or sugar. But you also have other foods. Most of the um, processed foods in Canada, 66% have added sugar to it. Uh, industry has gradually cranked up the sugar content of all our food. So there's a lot of added sugar in a lot of the stuff we eat. So what are free sugars, sugary drinks, and how they relate to health? Well, Sugary drinks are basically free sugars dissolved in liquid. It has a very high caloric content, 0.4 calories per mil, or around 240 calories in those 600 uh, mil bottles. The problem is it's marketed as a thirst quencher, often to be consumed with meals, but we don't compensate for liquid calories by reducing solid intake. So if you're watching a baseball game tonight and you had a pizza in front of you and you had three pieces of pizza on your plate, you had a glass of water, you would eat three pieces of pizza you get all those calories from pizza. But if you have a glass of cola beside that, you're gonna eat all three pieces of pizza and you're gonna drink the cola. Those additional calories are saved as fat, sort of preferentially. So it doesn't displace other calories. As a result, there's strong and convincing evidence linking sugar sweetened beverage consumption with obesity in children, youth, and adults. But it's not just mediated, the ill effects of sugary drinks aren't just mediated through overweight and obesity. This product is linked with ill health regardless of your weight status. So it's linked with heart disease, hypertension, hyperlipidemia, type 2 diabetes, 
and dental caries. So it leads to the question again about what is about sugar and how do sugary drinks promote disease regardless of weight? Is too much sugar in fact toxic or poison? There's a growing body of evidence that in fact it is. Uh, remember that sucrose is glucose and fructose combined together. Fructose is a non-essential molecule. The body actually has to detoxify and get rid of it. If, if individuals are born with, without the ability to metabolize fructose, they become extremely ill and may die. So when we consume sucrose, or fructose by itself, but sucrose a glucose fructose mixture, the fructose gets to our liver where it's converted to lipid. The lipid then either leaks out of the liver into the bloodstream and clogs up the arteries, or it stays there and causes fatty liver. The metabolites of fructose can lead to insulin resistance and type 2 diabetes. The metabolites cause uric acid production and hypertension. So we actually don't know what the safe threshold is for sucrose uh, and sugar. So we just have to be very careful about how much we ingest. So because of the uh, demonstrable risk associated with sugar, the World Health Organization has recommended to limit free sugar to less than 10% of your daily calories. So it'd be about 250 for men, 200 for, uh, uh, for women, and to consider limiting to less than 5%. Again, that's hard to do because so much of the food, 66% have sugar, and currently in Canada, it's hard to tell what that is, and it comes under a whole bunch of different names, and it's everywhere. So free sugars account for around 10% of the calories that Canadians consume. A single can of pop has nine teaspoons, or around 160 calories of, uh, of uh, sugar right there. Sugary drinks contain little, I mean, it has a little bit if it's, it's juice, but no nutrition if you're a sugar-sweetened beverage. It's the single largest contributor of added sugar to the diets of Canadian. And the simplest way to reduce free sugar intake is to reduce sugary drink consumption. So it's, it's bad stuff, and we really should do all we can to, get to, to limit it. In Canada, we have recent data from 2015 from the University of Waterloo. The average intake of sugary drinks by Canadians is around 440 mils per day, youth are very high consumers, close to 580 mils per day. This actually underestimates the impact because this is average, and roughly a third of Canadians don't drink the stuff at all. So those that are drinking are drinking a lot, uh, 751,000 mils per day. Very, very dangerous levels of uh, sugar. So again, the nutritional risk factors for unhealthy weights in children and youth are the same as for in adults. Uh, their sugary drink intake, sugars, refined grain, fast food intake. Fast food intake tends to be uh, um, detrimental because the food is refined grain. There's uh, often a lot of cheese on the pizzas, a lot of saturated fats, um, often it's accompanied by a sugary drink. And one of the things that keeps us, keeps humans from eating too much at any one time is we get tired of our food. So if you go to Africa where people are eating the same thing every day, you just eat enough to be full. And then you don't keep digging in. In North America now, if you go to fast food places, you can have Thai one night, Indian the next night, Chinese the next night, Mexican. Everything tastes great every night. So we tend to overeat. It's, it's natural. And we have an inadequate intake of fruits and vegetables. It's the same risk factors for adults. So this is a brand new study that just came out in the American Journal of uh, Clinical Nutrition, uh, uh, Mary LeBay and, and her work. And it's really good because they've looked at the different dietary components of our diet and how that... Uh, is related to obesity. So the top portion there, all the bars going off to the left, those are the ones that are relatively good for you, the best being whole fruits, vegetables uh, of different colors. So I put the star there because that's also uh, consistent with what we know for children. The worst of the worst down at the bottom corner, fast foods and carbonated drinks. Fast foods are also probably a vehicle for the ingestion of, of carbonated drinks as well. So we know those are bad, refined grains, that sort of thing. I put a little red uh, mark there by starchy vegetables uh, because one wonders about the role of potatoes and that can be uh, controversial in some areas. When the group, uh, Mary LeBay's group looked at potatoes, they separated French fries and potato chips, which are clearly bad. So they put them under salty snacks and the one there that they use for starchy vegetables is just regular old potatoes. So they, by their reckoning, they don't think potatoes are all that bad. Uh, if you look at this study from the States uh, done in 2011, pretty similar. Their, their big problem food items were potato chips uh, and French fries. Those are the big ones. Refined grains were a little bit further down the list. 
for beverages, worst of the worst, again, with sugar-sweetened beverages and also fruit juice, which is not surprising because fruit juice is a sugar, sugar you drink. So we talked before about not just obesity, but really nutrition is important for good health and chronic disease. So, and there's a big overlap, in fact, an almost complete overlap between those linkages. So the things, the nutritional components that increase the risk for cardiovascular disease are the ones we already talked about, the actors, sugary drinks, added sugar, solid fat, saturated fat, and refined grains. What reduces the risk? Well, fish, legumes, whole grains, fruits and vegetables, same sort of thing that was on Mary's graph there, but also polyunsaturated fatty acids and monounsaturated fatty acids. So that's that graph again, just again showing not just obesity now, but what is really important from a heart perspective. I'm going to infill this and just show you that when you would adapt a meal plan that's good for obesity and weight, it's also good for all the rest of your organs as well. I want to just spend a second or two to talk about the debate around whether butter is back, is butter good for you, uh, versus uh, the, the vegetable oil. So <clears throat> there's a lot of noise around this, and what people have kind of arrived upon is when the recommendations were made to decrease solid fat intake and then consume something else, the something else was very important. And there's some whoops learnings from that as well. So the zero mark there is if the incidence of disease with a certain percentage of saturated fat in your diet. So now we're looking at if you swap out saturated fat for something else, what does that do for your cardiovascular health? Well, the top there, trans fat, when you take a saturated fat and you instead replace it with uh, trans fat, things get worse. And that's what we did with the industrial, well, with our food supply, 70s and 80s into the 90s. And it's now uh, Canada is banning the use of trans fats. But it was very common because it was really good to use in baked goods. It has a long shelf life, doesn't go bad because I guess it's not natural. Uh, and it behaves very nicely from an industrial point of view, but it made everything worse from a cardiac point of view. We know that now it's getting rid of the, uh, the, of the food supply. In terms of other thing that was a whoops thing was down that little yellow bar. If you take saturated fats and you replace them with refined grains, starches, and sugars, you also made things worse. So in fact, you, that was a bad step. You actually increased the risk of heart disease, not a lot, by 1%. What should you be doing? Well, you should replace your saturated fats with calories from monounsaturated fat, fatty acids, so that's olive oil, polyunsaturated fatty acids, that's canola oil, corn oil, or replace them, those calories with whole grains, because we know whole grains are very, very good for you. Graphically, this looks at a different um, substitution. This is what happens if you have a certain level of carbohydrates, calories from carbohydrates, and you replace those calories with a different type of calorie. So if you take carbohydrates, uh, a good carbohydrate, and you replace it with saturated fat, you increase your risk of heart disease. If you replace it with trans fat, which is what we did globally for too long, uh, you markedly increase your risk of heart disease. What's more healthy? Monosaturated fats, so that's you know your olive oils, uh, avocados, uh, almonds. Polyunsaturated fats seem to be the best. So we'll come back to that sort of as a take home message. But again, all sorts of, uh, I would say, misinformation. People are wondering, butter is back, I should be eating bacon, that sort of thing. The answer is no. Uh, you stay away from those things. Go for the polys and the monounsaturated fats, but stay away from the simple refined grains and, of course, the trans fats. So nutrition and cancer, again, we're talking about health here. What increases the risk for cancer from nutrition? Sugar drinks, sugar, refined grains. Now we get processed meat and red meat coming in there uh, for risk of colon cancer. And alcohol also is a risk factor for, for breast cancer. You reduce the risk by those same good things, fruits and vegetables and whole grains. Type 2 diabetes, very similar basket of foods. So you increase your risk with sugar drinks, refined grains, processed meats, reduce, same sort of things that uh, also help for heart disease. So again, when you look at that meal plan for what you should be eating or what are risk factors for obesity versus non-obesity, it overlaps with the what you should be eating for almost all health in all areas. So this is a, a graphic uh, from Mosafarian in circulation just last year, which gives it kind of a good 
eating template. So, you know, basically eat as much as you can from the top of the blue, uh, the stuff at the bottom of the red, try to avoid industrial trans fats, absolutely. But again, within another year, you shouldn't be able to access that stuff. But the other things, the processed meats, high sodium foods, refined grains, they're not good for you either. Butter should be, in general, avoided. <clears throat> eggs in moderation, one to three eggs per week, not a big deal on a, on a population basis. Um, cheese is, now it depends upon who you read and who, who talks about it, but uh, cheese in moderation is probably okay. Moderation, uh, the graphic I can relate to the most is two servings uh, per day, which is like eight um, uh, cubes of dice. That's how much cheese. So. That's not a lot of cheese. I used to be a cheeseaholic. I was eating cheese for breakfast, lunch, and supper. Uh, so um, if you're a real cheesehead, uh, that's not much cheese. So, and that's certainly not what the cheese industry wants you to eat. That's not their business model. Uh, but a little bit of cheese now, again, it's not a bad thing. So what are the non-dietary non risk factors for unhealthy weights in children and youth? Well, excessive screen time, uh, sedentary time, inadequate physical activity, and inadequate sleep. Sleep is probably an underappreciated contributor to ill health. But these things, again, are also unhealthy for adults. I'm going to kind of go quickly now through the rest of this part. So screen time, why is screen time bad for kids? Well, children eat while they watch, and they eat what they watch. It's a tremendous marketing vehicle to teach our children to eat junk. 90% of the foods and beverages advertised on TV are unhealthy. If you have a TV in a child's bedroom, it's also a major risk factor for overweight and obesity. The recommendations are to have less than two hours of recreational screen time per day. In adults, the data also seems to kind of settle on that two hour. Uh, if you have less than two hours of screen time per day, that's the healthiest zone. If you have four hours or more, market increase in cardiovascular events, probably all tied up with sedentary time, in, uh, inadequate physical activity, and the role of sleep, of course. Uh, sedentary time in children and youth, TV-related. Um, <clears throat> I see Alan McManus in the audience uh, today as well, but it's also related to cerebral blood flow. When we're sitting around for a long time, we're not pumping well to our brain. Uh, and uh, that also has detrimental effects. In adults, excessive screen time is also linked with premature morbidity and mortality. Physical activity, I have it at the bottom of the slide, but I should probably should put it elevated to the top in terms of it's very difficult to outrun a bad diet. But physical activity is extremely beneficial. It does at high levels decrease the risk of overweight and obesity. It's really beneficial to keep pounds off. But if you think you can go for a run every now and again and eat whatever you want, sadly mistaken, because it's very, very hard to run off those uh, calories. In children and youth, um, we know that physical activity is good. It actually improves school performance. It's good for mental health. The recommendation that comes through from the Canadian Society for Exercise Physiology is one hour of moderate to vis uh, vigorous physical activity per day. <clears throat> but like all activity for all ages, more is better than none. So if you're totally sedentary, getting up and walking for 5, 10, 15 minutes is good. If you can intersperse this with little bouts of high intensity um, physical activity, the return on investment for a few minutes of very brisk walking, getting breathless is huge. That first 20 minutes of physical activity is where huge gains occur. In adults, the, the data on physical activity is even more remarkable. If you could bottle this and put it into a pill, it would be uh, sold everywhere. Physical activity improves all aspects of health, cardiovascular, blood pressure, metabolic syndrome, diabetes, breast, colon cancer, depression, all causes of mortality decrease when you're physically active. The biggest gains come in for when you take someone who's non-active at all and get them going at least 15 to 20 minutes per day, and then you still get gains, but it begins to plateau a bit. Uh, you, uh, not quite the same return on investment. And if you can uh, intersperse that with little bouts of high intensity activity, not riding a bicycle, not necessarily until you feel like puking, and then just kind of uh, going slowly, but going for a walk and then taking some stairs, and then uh, maybe walking fast for a little bit, so you're a little bit breathless, and then slowing down. Sleep, as I said, is very much underappreciated. There is very good appreciation now between the role of sleep and obesity, even uh, in the age range from zero to four. So uh, children with shortened sleep duration in that age cohort, when followed on, they have a much higher risk of subsequent obesity. For teens, less sleep means an increased risk for obesity, but also you begin to see 
markers of type 2 diabetes developing. The recommendations are for sleep, preschoolers 10 to 13, for teens, uh, uh, sorry, in, and in the um, 9 to 12 age range, uh, you want to get 12 hours of sleep. For teens, you want 8 to 10 hours. Most teens are getting nowhere near that mainly because of the devices, the screens, that sort of thing. They take them to bed, and it's impossible to uh, resist those text messages that come at night. In adults, the evidence is also quite clear. There was a recent statement came out from the American Heart Association looking at the role of sleep in cardiometabolic health. A lack of sleep leads to poor glucose tolerance, decreased insulin sensitivity, so again, raising your risk of type 2 diabetes. When you are not sleeping enough, you have an increased level of a hormone ghrelin, which causes hunger, and a lower level of leptin. So for people like myself that used to work at night in the hospital, nurses and physicians, uh, and others that work at night, we would be prowling around hunting for food uh, from midnight to 3 o'clock in the morning. And it was because of this hormonal change that happened. You are very hungry, then you're meant to be sleeping. So it's a very significant risk factor for excess weight gain, as well as heart disease and, and type 2 diabetes. So for adults, it should be getting seven or more hours per night. So what should we do? Well, I think we need to move away from single solutions. It's not diet or activity. It's diet and activity. It's nutrition planning. Focus should be on getting the habits right, and the chances are you will be healthy. So it's not a matter of you must lose 15 pounds or 20 pounds. If you adopt that type of uh, meal plan, which is basically a Mediterranean type of diet or the DASH uh, type diet, chances are you will begin to lose weight. There are studies which look at ad libitum eating, eating as much as you want on a Mediterranean type diet or a, um, uh, a DASH diet, and people begin to lose weight because of the low caloric density. They eat till they're full, they're not walking around hungry, uh, but they get back to a, a more stable state. And I'll also say don't forget about the planet uh, children and youth are going to inherit because of the role between agriculture, what we eat, and greenhouse gas emissions. And I just wanted to put this slide up because there's a lot of talk now about the paleo diet, the uh, Zome diet, the Atkins diet, very, very high meat-based diet, very high uh, dairy-type diet. Well, livestock continues. This slide shows 14% of total greenhouse emissions, but other, the Suzuki Foundation, I think, just said 18%. So it's a very, very significant contributor to greenhouse gases. We don't want to shift our dietary patterns to dairy and meat. We want to go more to a plant-based diet for health, for the health of us, our children, but also the planet. If you look at where agricultural uh, emissions from animals come, it's, it's beef. It's uh, beef cattle and dairy cattle, and it's, um, it's gaseous emission, enteric gaseous emission. So it's there farting into the, into the atmosphere. That's a lot of methane gas, and methane is much worse than regular CO2. So we don't want to shift our, uh, our, uh, our, our habits. So get the habits right. Chances are you will be healthy. Remember the planet. There's a 24-hour movement guideline that the Canadian Society for Exercise Physiology has. It talks about sweating, so moderate to vigorous physical activity for up to an hour a day for children and youth. Step, getting up, walking around wherever you can. Don't sit still. There is evidence that you actually are not as healthy as you think you are if you go for your 45 minute run in the morning and then you're sitting at your desk for nine hours, you have to get up and move around. Sleep is sleep is very, very important. We are all sleep deprived. Uh, daylight savings time is coming next week. There's evidence uh, worldwide that when people spring forward and get an hour's less sleep, traffic accidents rise because you're just not as alert the next day. And sitting sedentary behavior has to be controlled. <clears throat> Keeping in mind this particular graphic again, where you want to shift your diet, you want to avoid those meats, avoid that Atkins diet. It's not good for you, it's not good for the planet. So what should we be doing? Get the habits right and chances are you'll be healthy. Aim for some moderate to vigorous physical activity each day. Any is better than none. Getting up, walking fast, get the heart rate going. Get a few hours of light physical activity each day. Every step counts. Don't sit too long, get up and walk around when you get a chance. Get enough sleep. I added this in here, although I didn't even talk about it up till now, family meals at least three times per week. There's increasing link between family meals together and um, better regulation of what you eat, but also mental health. Uh, there was a presentation in Victoria at the International Conference on Exercise and uh, Behavior and Nutrition from Europe, the, the uh, iEurope group. Their single intervention was getting families to eat together and they saw improvements in children's weight status. So it's 
it's really underappreciated. In terms of the diet, the Mediterranean diet or the dietary approach to stop hypertension, it's not that complicated, it's plant-based. And also, just I'll put in a last word here, is to support Health Canada with their healthy eating strategy. Right now, uh, before the um, House of Commons, uh, I think it's going to happen on November 6th, will be the first reading of a bill to restrict the marketing of unhealthy foods and beverages to kids. This is very, very important because right now we are teaching our children and youth to eat junk. 90% of the food that they're seeing advertised is garbage, all the stuff that's in that red zone over there. And it is going to shorten their lifespans. It's unethical to teach our children to eat this stuff. Uh, other thing that Health Canada has is new proposals for front of pack labeling. The current nutrition facts table, I think, are totally unintelligible. Uh, even if I think I know this stuff pretty well, I look at them, I said, what the heck does this mean? How much fiber here, which I do? So they're going to have user-friendly front of pack labeling. So you'll have uh, kind of a stop sign motif if it's really high in sugars or saturated fat or salt. The food industry is pushing back against these two uh, initiatives. So if you get a chance, if you see your MP, Steve Fuhr, whoever your MP is, uh, uh, let them know that uh, you highly support this or send an email to Justin. That's it. Thank you.